the 10th of July, 2006 at around 11 p.m. and we're on the I-90 tunnel in Boston when a portion of the ceiling weighing roughly 25 tons comes crashing down into the traffic, tragically killing one of the passengers traveling through the tunnel at the time. I'll be going through why this collapse occurred seemingly without warning nine years after opening to traffic, what the investigation undertaken by the National Bureau of Traffic Safety or NTSB for short uncovered during their investigation and the decisions that led up to this tragedy. Now things are never as clean cut as expected. And it's always easier in hindsight to say your decisions would have been different. So it's important that you stick through to the end until you have all the facts behind the true cause of this tragedy. So I'll start off by going through by listing some of the major elements in the construction of a tunnel. It's made up the inner vault, which is the main structural lining of the tunnel that helps resist the forces of either the soil or the water that the tunnel is passing through. And of course, you need that carriageway, which is where the traffic lanes lie on to allow traffic to pass through the tunnel. And typically, there is also a ceiling. And the purpose of this ceiling is to create ventilation to ensure that you have clean air in the tunnel and to extract any smoke in case of a fire. So let's move up to the ceiling. You see the ceiling is hung a couple of meters below the top of the tunnel vault and supported on a series of beams that are periodically hung by hanger rods. These hanger rods are then connected to hanger plates and there's two main ways you can post fix these hanger plates to the ceiling of the vault. And these are either a mechanical or an epoxy anchor. Mechanical anchors, as the name suggests, provide a mechanical fixing that helps resist any loads. See, much like this bolt here, they have a wedge at the end. So when it's tightened up, the wedge grips in place, mechanically locking it into the roof of the vault, where an epoxy anchor is essentially a threaded bar that is glued to the roof of the vault of the tunnel. And you do this by drilling a hole, having to clean it out, and then typically filling the hole with a two-part epoxy. So an epoxy resin and a hardener. You then screw that threaded bar into the hole, mixing its two components. Now it takes time before that epoxy sets and hardens before any load can be applied to that anchor. So you have two possible solutions here. So you have the epoxy anchor that's typically cheaper that then has to be screwed into the hole, but it takes time before it can support load. Or you have a mechanical anchor that's typically harder to install and it's typically more expensive as well. The chosen solution for fixing these anchors to the ceiling of the I-90 ended up being the epoxy. And at the time, there was discussions between the contractor and the engineer over this choice. With the engineer raising concerns around potential strength issues with the epoxy solution, and the fact that epoxy anchors can perform poorly during a fire. You see, an epoxy anchor is much like a plastic, so when it heats up, it softens. Unlike the mechanical fixings that is directly fixed to the concrete that doesn't display these properties. So if you find this content informative, don't forget to anchor down the like button. Not only does it help me out, but also gets out to more people so they may be able to learn the issues behind this collapse. So now let's move into the construction of the tunnel and it's 1999 and the contractor is installing the ceilings in the I-90 when he looks over and notices that five of the bolts had pulled loose in the HOV lane. In fact, they had pulled out around 50 millimeters and this depth was increasing over time. This was a mere two months after their installation and they had actually initially passed their pullout tests, meaning they had reached the desired capacity. So a series of meetings were undertaken between the contractor, engineer, and the epoxy supplier. And they came to the conclusion that the methodology of installation was at fault and was incorrect. See, there's two ways that you can drill holes into a concrete structure. You can the core a hole, which is much easier installation, but it leaves a completely smooth hole. So it's a lot harder for the epoxy to bond to or you can hammer drill it. So it's a harder installation application, but it leaves a nice rough surface with the epoxy bonding. Regardless of whether you're coring or hammer drilling, these holes also need to be thoroughly cleaned out. And they also found out that these holes were not being cleaned out until one week after the drilling or coring had actually occurred. And this means that it's a lot harder to remove all the dust in that hole. And this can have result in a reduction in bonding strength of up to around 20%. And this is why they concluded that the failures were due to its installation. However, there were other people at the time raising concerns that the actual true failure of why these anchors had pulled out had not actually been identified. Having come to the conclusion that they believed that the installation was at fault, they replaced all the failed anchors 
and it actually undertook an additional testing regime where they doubled the load in the pull-off tests. They actually performed this test on additional anchors within the tunnel, but only to the HOV lanes. During the almost 190 tests, there were 19 bolts that ended up pulling out from this additional testing regime. However, at the time, it was rationalized that 17 of these were in the mock-up area and playing with the epoxy when they were unexperienced and that they no longer had the issue that they saw with those 17 bolts pulling out. So now let's move into what the NTSB found through their investigation. And in first inspecting the site, they found that roughly 26 tons of ceiling panels had come down, along with their supporting beams, supporting plates and hanger rods. And when inspecting these areas, they found that the panels were relatively intact or undamaged and only really damaged from the fall. The plates were undamaged, still had the hanger rods and the hanger plates attached. So this means that neither the concrete panels, beams, hanger rods or hanger plates were the point of failure. So this leaves us with the epoxy anchors. So now let's bring our attention to the anchors. Now the anchors were relatively undamaged and they'd pulled somewhat clean from the roof, meaning the anchor had not suffered a steel failure, nor it's showing the classic signs of an epoxy failure of a cone of concrete coming with it, pointing towards either an epoxy issue or an installation issue. And when inspecting the anchors, they found that there was a series of voids and fractured concrete on the anchors potentially pointing towards the installation issues that we discussed earlier. Also curious, it was also seen that the epoxy had pulled somewhat clean of the roof for some period of time before its failure, meaning the epoxy was exposed to the air, similar to the failures that we saw earlier during construction. So how about the rest of the ceiling in the I-90? And when inspecting the remaining ceiling, they found roughly around 25% of the anchors had pulled some distance from the ceiling, meaning this was not a local issue, but more widespread issue within the tunnel. And there was actually additional panels that are also at imminent risk of collapse. So why did this take nine years before we saw this failure occurring? And the NTSB investigated the installation of these anchors. And they found that even though there was incorrect installation, that in itself was not sufficient enough to cause the failure observed on site, essentially ruling out that installation alone was at fault. So now questions were being asked, does the epoxy have sufficient capacity to resist the loads that it was supporting? Now, if we think back, these bolts had already been load tested and actually they'd been undertaken an additional load testing regime where they doubled the load capacity, meaning that even in the short term, they had more than sufficient capacity to resist these loads. You see, this is where the problem lies. See, the epoxy was being applied in a long-term situation. As it was hung from the ceiling, a constant force was being applied to the anchor over time. And some epoxies can exhibit creep-like behavior. So what does this mean? So creep-like behavior is when a constant force is being applied to an element and the structure slowly stretches over time, allowing it to move down further and further, essentially slowly creeping. And as this creeping occurs, it's slowly weakening the bonds between the epoxy. Again, this was a known concern of epoxies at the time. So was the epoxy being used appropriate for this application? The epoxy being used was supplied by Powers Fasteners. It was the NRC 1000 Gold, and it came in two versions. It came in a standard set, and a fast set mix. The epoxies to support the ceiling was the fast set mix, and this was also confirmed during testing of the anchors in the tunnel. So is there a difference between the fast set and standard set versions of these epoxies? Under a short term loading application, both epoxies perform adequately. However, they perform drastically different under a sustained loading situation. You see, the standard epoxy does perform well under sustained loads, meaning that it shows minimal to no creep-like behavior when applied from a sustained loading situation. Whereas the rapid set epoxy wasn't able to support a sustained load over the long term and displaying major creep-like behaviors when applied in this application, meaning that it was not appropriate to be supported from a sustained loading like the application in the tunnel to support the ceiling. So why was the fast set epoxy 
used in this situation? And did the contractor know that the Farset epoxy suffered from these creep issues? The investigation from the NTSB found that the contractor didn't make any choice between using either version. And so they were unaware that the Farset version was being inappropriately used. So how about Powell's fasteners? The NTSB looked into the records of Powell's fasteners and found that they had undertaken creep testing on the standard version of this epoxy and that it had passed with flying colors, meaning that it was an appropriate for a long-term loading situation. They also found that in 2000, Powell's fasteners released a technical memo after the installation of these ceiling panels in the I-90. And from their evaluation, they found that the fast set version of this epoxy should only be used in short-term loading situations. And as they dug deeper, they found that Powers had actually undertaken additional testing of the fast set version as early as 1996, before its installation in the tunnel at the I-90. And the fact that this testing had actually shown that the fast set version failed these creep tests. The NTSB concluded that Powell's fasteners had issued information on the Farset epoxy that was inadequate and at best misleading, allowing for the epoxy to be used to support sustained loading in the I-90. The NTSB also concluded that as past failures had been identified of these anchors pulling out of the ceiling, a regular testing regime should have been implemented to ensure that the issues with the anchors had actually been addressed and there would be no additional failures identified in the roof. The NTSB also concluded that if these inspections had been undertaken, it would have clearly identified the creep issue with these anchors. So we can see that there was many errors, admissions, oversights and missed opportunities that all came together to cause this tragedy. But it really comes down to an epoxy that had two versions. One that was okay for long-term loading and one that wasn't. And the one that ended up in the tunnel was the one that was inappropriate. So if you're interested in supporting the channel further, I've got links to my Patreon. So what do you get by signing up? You get more access to me, some behind the scene content and some future members only Q and A's. I hope to see you over there. And don't forget to like and subscribe and ding that bell to get all updates. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.